Anyway, I use the Jack and Jill analogy to do so. We have a duopoly. We have Jack and we have Jill, obviously. And he shows the demand schedule for water. Now, the best thing for Jack and Jill to do, obviously, is to act in unison to fix the price at the level at the in this you know at the level at which a uh, monopoly would You'd set the price at uh, sixty dollars a gallon and produce sixty um, sixty. Sixty dollars a gallon and sixty gallons in total. So what they would do, depending on the situation, they might split the profits in half. Jack gets thir gets fifty percent of the profit, and Jill gets fifty percent of the profit. Now taking them both together, this is the best thing they can do in order to maximize profit. Is to collude and set the price at sixty dollars a gallon and produce each produce thirty dollars. Produce 30 gallons of water for a total of 60 gallons for the town. However, um, if they f if they renege on their agreement, either one of them, they'll make more money, obviously, by producing more at a lower price. Uh, not believe price. So they're instead of reach of uh, achieving a. a a uh, monopoly price, monopoly output, they're likely to, um, let's say, produce 80 gallons of water in this demand schedule and charge, instead of $60 a gallon, $40 a gallon. If they, if one reneges, obviously the other will renege, and then they, then the uh, su supply and demand um, will, will, it will adjust their prices accordingly to maximize profits, profit individually of one another and that you'll reach a Nash equilibrium so if oligopolists are unsuccessful in colluding uh, the, the oligopoly price will be less than the monopoly price but also more than the competitive price a price in a competitive free market environment and again if if the oligopoly is unsuccessful in colluding, they will produce an output greater than that of a monopoly, but not as great as that of a competitive market. Uh, they'll fall in between. And it's either monopolistically competitive or perfectly competitive. Um, uh, see, see, you take an oligopolist at any time he has the option to raise production by one unit. He has that marginal decision. Now, marginal means unit by unit. He makes decision. He makes. He decides whether to produce 1,977 units or 1,978 units. He doesn't decide whether to produce, you know, the widget A or not to produce widget A. If you're, he's in the market, he's deciding exactly how many he's going to produce. And that's his discrete unit. It's not a continuous uh, measurement. It's not a continuous variable. It's a discrete variable. Uh, so, we're th so he's thinking at the margin. And he's weighing the output effect against the price effect. Now, if he increases the output, obviously he's selling, he's selling more product. So he's getting more revenue, right? That increases profit, but the price effect is: the more you produce, the lower price you have to charge. Cause you know, cause of the demand schedule, uh, na the nature of the demand schedule, you, you would have to, you know, charge a lower price in order to sell that extra unit, because uh, people aren't going to buy the same amount of, let's say. Um, People, even with water, not, or even with food, say there's a monopoly on food, um, they're not going to change. People are not going to buy the same amount of food if you charge a hundred dollars, hundred dollars versus for you know, hundred dollars for a meal versus five dollars for a meal. If you charge five dollars for a meal, meal, people are going to eat a lot more. If you charge a hundred dollars for a meal. You're gonna lose customers. Um, people want to eat less; they'll just be you know, skinnier. Um, people won't be able to afford it. They won't be able to get loans from banks because there's no way they'd be able to repay it if you charge like hundred dollars per meal. 
uh, even if you had a monopoly in food, uh, the, the monopolist couldn't just charge an infinite amount for the food. He would have to charge um, monopolies. I don't want to go back into monopolies again. That's a separate video. How do monopolies? Let's see. How do monopolies maximize a profit? Let's say uh, we'll to maximize profit. You produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that amount of output. But you find the price by taking uh, when you look, you're looking at um, a Cartesian coordinate system. You have the x-axis, so you find the how much the the max profit maximizing quantity by finding the uh, intersection of the ma marginal revenue curve and the marginal cost curve, and then you draw a vertical line on that Cartesian coordinate system. And where that intersects the demand curve, um, that's where you set the price. Uh, it's hard. Now, obviously, I want a whiteboard because the most effective way to learn is to teach. And I'm doing this so that I have it in my long term memory. If I go over something I just read and then discuss it in a video and then explain it, I really wish I had. I'm going to buy a whiteboard. I am. Um, once I have the money. Uh, and then I'm going to do lectures on every chapter I read about um, and explain what I just read, explain my take on it, where I disagree with the author, discuss case studies that I've read about before to con so connect it to previous knowledge that will further cement in my long term memory and bring those memories back to make them strengthen the, uh, the fibers of the neurons and uh, just improve my overall understanding of the subject matter you know in this case microeconomics um, and hopefully I can become a good enough lecturer uh, on the subject that other people will find it useful to watch my lectures because I'll have a unique take on it after studying it from multiple different perspectives and uh, you know just put the lectures out there for free and then I'll also, as new economic events arise, I'll analyze them just as Peter Schiff would or Ron Paul would, but from my own un unique perspective, and apply economic principles to current economic events. And I'll also go over those economic, I'll explain those economic principles, um, go over them in short for people that are unfamiliar with them. So I'll go over like the basics of um, you know profit mo maximization for a monopoly firm. If we're discussing, uh, we'll also profit maximize profit maximization for collusion among a cartel. If that's what you know, if something comes up in the market that relates to that uh, knowledge, to that uh, to these concepts within microeconomics. Um, this, <laughs> this is what I do for fun <laughs> but uh, yeah I just want to cement it into my long term memory and this will help me keep it by constantly uh, by you know teaching is the best way to learn you know you're activating the verbal cortex you are um, it's an active process this is more neural activity so in, you're interlating more ideas, you're uh, analyzing things, you're bringing things back from your your memory banks and then bringing them to the front of your mind so that neurons are strengthened and so on. And then what you just read when you go over and discuss it, uh, that's going to strengthen the degree to which I recall this information and the degree to which I apply it to, um, to apply these concepts to um, real world situations in the future. Um, okay, so we just the last thing on the textbook on the textbook I touched on was the output effect and the price effect. An oligopolist must weigh the output effect against the price effect. Okay, and then he sets the price where those two effects perfectly balance each other. Okay, so where the output effect equals the price effect, that's where he sets the price. If he cannot collude with the other oligopolists um, in the market. Obviously, um, 
if there's not barriers to entry and the number of firms in an oligopoly increases, well, obviously it's not going to it's less and less as number of firms increase. The the degree to which it resembles, you know, your standard oligopoly decreases and starts to resemble more and more of, you know, the our graphs of the market more and more start to resemble. Um, our concept of perfect competition or monopoly, mono, monopolistically competitive market as the number of firms increase. Um, well, no, it would, because the number of firms selling an oligopoly is a few firms selling essentially the same product. Um, you could say it would, it would only approach perfect competition, but really. Uh, if the airline industry, you, you allow competition in the airline industry, you would still have differenti differentiated products due to intellectual property. People would, different airlines would have, diff had different uh, intellectual property in terms of um, aircraft. You know, certain airlines would have, um, would own the patent for a certain type of uh, jet aircraft. Um, and uh, they don't other sorts of patents that would differentiate the you know the flight. They're not just selling the flight; they're se selling the experience of the flight. So if you did have competition, even if you got rid of a lot of the regulations, the airline industry would not become a perfectly competitive environment. It would become a monopolistically competitive environment because you have differentiated products. Um, the only way to create a perfectly competitive environment within the airline industry is to not only to get rid of the anti-competitive regulations, but also to um, reform a IP law. Uh, and there's a lot of Austrians that advocate completely gr getting rid of IP law. Now, I have not seen debates on this. I haven't studied this issue in depth. But I am aware of the the origins of IP law and the detrimental effects it can have on the economy. Uh, I have to say the issue in more depth before I come to a firm conclusion. Watch a few uh, debates on the subject. Read a few books about it um, before I uh, can say anything with uh, confidence. Let's see. Now we get into the economics of cooperation. Obviously, the prisoner's dilemma is most relevant. Um, the prisoner's di dilemma. Um, he explains it in this way, you take Bonnie and Clyde, you put them in two different rooms. Now the police officer, the detective, the, you know, he says, let's say, he says to Bonnie, right now we can lock you up for one year. If you confess to the bank robbery and implicate your partner, however, we'll give you immunity and you can go free. Your partner will get 20 years in jail. But if you both confess to the crime, we won't need your testimony, and we can avoid the cost of a trial. So you will each get an immediate, an intermediate sentence of eight years. So that's the prisoner's dilemma. Um, now he goes over why in many cases. You know, obviously, it's better for both of them. You know, if you take them both together, it's better that they both say nothing, and they both get a year in jail. For a total of two years in jail. Now, if they both rat on each other, uh, <laughs> both get both of them get eight years in jail, eight years in prison, in jail, eight years in prison. They, you can use the terms interchangeably, but really, for specific, eight years in prison. Um, so t for a total of sixteen years. But if but if you take, you know, if you're the individual, you're Bonnie, you're Clyde. Um, if if you can, if you take out all the factors, take away um, the relationship, uh, their trust, their love affair, um, all those other factors. If you take out all those other factors, I mean, saying it's Bonnie and Clyde really complicates the issue. Obviously, um, just makes it more memorable. But just take out all those factors and, and just think they're just acting as economic actors. That's it. There's no take out all the um, other take about take out the value of trust. Take out the value of you know the relationship with one another. Um, 
I know, I know. This is, this is we're trying to simplify the example to understand the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, all right. In, ter in economic terms, the dominant strategy for say Clyde is to is to rat out on Bonnie and impl implicate her. Because either way, whether she confesses or she doesn't confesses, he ends up with less prison time. If she doesn't confess, she gets eight years in jail, but he goes free. He gets immunity. If she confesses, he gets eight years in prison instead of 20. If he decides, if he makes his decision to uh, to rat out Bonnie. Not to confess, Bonnie rats out Clyde then Clyde will get eight years in prison for ratting out Bonnie instead of 20. So if, if you separate them and prevent them from talking, obviously, with one another, um, and so one time event, then it's better in this case too, obviously. It's a better case to, um, to not cooperate. But if you play, if you do the uh, Algopoly, if you do the, I mean, if you do the Prisoner's Dilemma uh, in a tournament, you find that if you if you set it up at you know two people in a separate room and they do the the the, the goal of the tournament, you know, is the what they did is they took people and they put them in a they, they had them on computers and. The goal was to get. At, they played multiple rounds of the prisoner's dilemma, and the goal was to get the lowest possible amount of years in prison. So they played it multiple, multiple times. So, um, so you, you know, obviously, this is just a game. But the goal of the game is over, you know, several, se several trials of the Bonnie and Clyde uh, game where you get to know what the other person is doing you, you know he, that person rats on you you get to know and then you play the game again or he doesn't he or she doesn't rat on you you get to know and then you play the game again 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 and again 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 then you have you're doing it over the long term uh, which more clearly represents um, the market situation because it's not a one-time event you don't just sell you know you know uh, 60 gallons of water one time your it's a long-term situation you know that Bonnie and Clyde example that was a one-shot thing but in the real world when we're talking about oligopoly excluding is over the long term so um, the winner of the program you know, was the one obviously with the to least total years in jail, and the best strategy at all. There were tons of different strategies. People came up with all these complex, you know, I you know formulas. Mathematic mathematicians came up with all these really complicated ways of trying to win the game. But ultimately, the winner, um, the winning, the most powerful strategy turned out to be t something called tit for tat, which is quite simply, you start by cooperating. And then do whatever the other player did last time. Thus, a tit for tat player cooperates until the other player defects. Then she defects until the other player cooperates again. In other words, this strategy starts out friendly, penalizes unfriendly players, and then forgives them if com if complicated strategies. I mean, forgives them if warranted. Um, you know, to to the you know the person that conducted the experiment, he was an economist. To his surprise. This was the most effective strategy. It's quite simple, and um, this this experiment, this uh, game theory experiment, um, shows that it suggests that this may be a good rule of thumb for playing some other games in life, for just for life in general, for, for business. Um, obviously, if you're an oligopolist, tit for tat would probably be obviously the most effective strategy for you to pursue because you're essentially um, you're essentially playing the prisoner's dilemma uh, game multiple times you 
you you can make an agreement to both set your set your prices at a certain level and set your quantity produced at a certain level and at any time you can renege but then you the other person will renege and you both end up getting screwed in the long term and if you, you do that multiple times you know what you want to do obviously is tit for tat you want to try to collude if that doesn't work then you renege on the agreement too and then if the other person says okay I'm sorry can we collude again then you collude and say you effing whatever okay it's fine but if you renege again I'm gonna renege just as soon as you renege and we're both gonna make less profits you mf'er understand that and then I mean obviously you just say listen this and then you might tr yeah you just the second time around be like either you stick with it this time or I'm done you wanna make more profits or not do you wanna do you wanna price fix or don't you wanna price, price fix if you try to screw me over again and tr try to make more than me and steal market share by lowering your price and increasing quantity produced contrary to our secret agreement you know, I'm not gonna. We're done. I'm gonna try to run you out of business. We can either compete and both make more money, or I mean, we can either both cooperate and make more money, or we can compete and I can try to run you out of business. And we're, you know, uh, that would probably be the best strategy, obviously. But in more general sense, um, yeah, uh, in business you. In other areas of life, always start off friendly. If not, another person, you know, sues you, sues you, you sue you sue back. If they drop the suit, then you drop the suit. Maybe I don't know. But yeah, a good rule of thumb: always start off friendly. But but if someone's a threat to you, then you you defend yourself and you fight and you fight them back. And when they say, okay, peace, peace, I give up, I give up. Then you stop, and you know you forgive them. If you know, but it's more complex in the real world. You, you have to judge that person based on his past behavior. Um, did he just take a swing at you because he was drunk and his girlfriend just girlfriend just broke up with you, or is he a serial killer? You know, you, this in the real world is much more complex, but in general. You always want to start off friendly with other people, and even if someone's mean, if someone's just mean to you, just says mean to things to them, well, sometimes it's better not to, resp you know, it may or may not be better to just remain, to just not respond in kind, depending on the situation. But if it's a bully, if they're bullying you and trying to make your life miserable and they're harassing you, then you either, you know. If they're sexually harassing your girlfriend, you want to tell them you step the fuck off, or yeah, you know, and then, yeah. You know. Or if it's a group of guys, then you call the police because you know, unless you're an MMA fighter, you're not gonna stop a group of five dudes who are trying to hurt you and your woman. And you know, I mean, you could try, and you sh well, first things first, call the police. Then you tell them, listen, I will fuck. You know, hopefully you have a firearm on you. If you have a firearm, then you just show the firearm, and you know you make it a uh, mutually self-destructive. If they have firearms, and you have a firearm. Well, if they all shoot you, you're gonna shoot at least one of them. You just aim for the leader of the pack. You aim your gun toward his head and say, listen, you can shoot me, but I'll get a shot off before you do. And the best thing for you to do, uh, I don't want to fight. I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to shoot you, and you don't want to shoot me, so how about we just go our separate ways, and hopefully, that's what happens, hopefully your wife also has a firearm, or your girlfriend, then, you know, two versus five, it's just one get, versus five, I think all women have firearms, so you can get into game theory about violence, but game theory is also very relevant to firearm ownership. But I'm not gonna get into that right now. That's another video. There's no, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and 
the CDC, both did meta studies of all the studies that ever were on gun control measures. Couldn't find a single study that lowered gun that lowered gun that lowered violence. You know, obviously because guns don't kill people. People kill people. They can do it with bats. They can do it with knives. They can do it with their bare hands. And you know, you t- make gun you take away all the guns. Well, that just puts people that are bigger and stronger. At, and who are part of gangs at a larger advantage than people who are smaller and weaker. It makes puts men in a dominant position over women in terms of their ability to defend themselves and their ability to, you know, kill each other. You know, obviously, if you have the average man, the average woman, they get into a third, you know, for whatever reason, one's trying to kill the other. Um, the man is more likely to win using a uh, uh, using an object that's not a firearm. Now, if a woman has a firearm and a man has a firearm, and they're both trained in how to use a firearm, it's a 50, you know, they're on equal grounds. It equalizes unequals in terms of physical strength. This isn't, physical strength does not matter when you're having when when one has a firearm, when you have a firearm, and someone else has a firearm. For the most part, it doesn't matter unless you're a small child and you can't even carry a gun. But if you are a 100-pound woman and a 200-pound guy with a gun, your 100-pound woman with a gun and a 200-pound guy, pound guy with a gun is trying to get into your house, that puts you actually, you know, in a better, a better uh, position in terms of defending yourself because you have the element of surprise. He doesn't know where you're at when he's trying to break into the house, but you, you're probably going to know where he's at. You're in here. I'm trying to get in. Then you just put yourself in a, somewhere, um, you know, like behind that corner, saying if some say someone was trying to get through that door, and you're in a pan of woman, and it's some dude uh, just trying to get break into your house, you stand behind the door, or you just shoot him through the door. You know, someone's trying to get into your house late at night. You're 100 pound woman by yourself alone, and just some random person is trying to get inside your house. That you don't know, shoot them. You shoot them. You don't call the police, cause a big, a two hundred, you know, two hundred pound guy can break that, can kick down the door in two seconds, in one second. You know, even I could kick down that freaking door. Not that strong. It's not that hard. Like any, even like police officers that are like 120, 130 pounds can kick down a do- kick down, open a door. It's locked. It's not that hard. You just have to know how to do a good front kick. Or just, you know, do the old shoulder thing, you know, and it comes right open. Now, obviously, if the guy does that and comes in and you're behind the corner, you're going to take, obviously, use the corner as your, um, as your, as your cover and then come around the corner and then you shoot him once he breaks open the door. And, um, you have the element of surprise. He doesn't know you're behind that corner. You have a bit better chance of killing him than he does of sh- killing you. And he probably doesn't have his gun out at that moment. I mean, maybe he does. Maybe he, open- he has a gun right here, kicks down the door. Um, could be an angry ex-boyfriend. It could, you know, because you know you broke up with him. You could. And that happens a lot. Guys with narcissistic personality disorder, and the woman has codependency and then the woman is abused too much and she says I'm done with you and the guy's like no you're not and then he sees her with the new guy and she, after she has enough she usually just finds the nicest guy in town and uh, seeks him out uh, and uh, he's the nar- guy with the narcissistic, personal- narcissistic personality disorder He's likely to try to murder that woman, or to at least beat the crap out of her, to the within an inch of her life. Um, especially if he has anger management problems. Um, so that's why he want firearms, and you know, taking one of the firearms like doesn't solve. You look at you can do all you can look at all the case studies there ever was. Gun control does not lower levels of violence. Over in the UK total gun ban what do you have highest level one of the highest levels of violence in 
the European Union through the roof. You know, people have access. Guess what? They burn down. You know, when they ride, they burn down buildings. They use baseball bats. They use knives. They, you know. So again, that you know, and they try to point out like, oh, mass shootings, blah 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 blah. Well, if you had a higher rate of gun ownership, how many people are going to die when you have, let's say, you no, know, you have 31 people with a gun, and one of, and the 31st person wants to shoot all the other people. How many shots is he going to get off? One. Because all the other people are going to see, going to turn, see him, with the gun. And they're going to hear the noise, they're going to turn right towards them, they're going to pull out their guns, and they're going to shoot him. Or at least, at least like, one of them has a firearm. It's not a gun-free school zone. Someone's going to pull out a gun. Like the Appalachian Law School shooting. Gun, you know, it's a gun-free school zone, but, the, dude, the students there hunted. One of them had a gun in their car. They went out, they grabbed it, and how many, was it a mass shooting? No, the guy tried to kill as many people as he could, he was completely off the, his rocker, but they, um, they cornered him, and, um, until the police arrived, and I actually believe they didn't even shoot him, they actually, even though he killed two or three people, they just got him into a corner, um, and, uh, it prevented him from hurting any other people. And they had a gun, you know, a gunfight, but you know, um, as I recall, he didn't. He was. They didn't kill him. I would have killed him. I would have shot him dead. You just killed two students. I don't, you're you're fucking dead. You know, I'm not gonna corner you and let the police do it. I mean, you're you're a danger to everybody. You're a danger to me. You're trying to shoot me. But whatever. I mean, they've showed a lot of restraint in that situation. You, you have a mass shooter, and I have a firearm. I have a concealed carry, and you're trying to shoot a bunch of students. I'm pulling out my gun as soon as I see you, and you're dead. And that's why you want wider firearm ownership, because then mass shootings don't happen. We want, because a mass shooter can only shoot a bunch of people so long as no one else has a gun. As soon as someone else has a gun, then you, you know, you're both taking cover, and you're both, you know, an equal threat to one another. Well, not an equal threat, but approximately equal threat based upon the amount of training you have in firearms and uh, tactical uh, shooting. Um, this got way off. Oligopolies. Uh, public policy towards oligopolies. Let's see. 